Boys need to see a man in order to become a man. And our culture no longer offers good role models. 50 years ago, if you were to say to a boy, be a man, he knew exactly what that meant because he was immersed in a culture with movies starring men like Paul Newman and Sidney Poitier. It meant to be courageous, to be willing to sacrifice yourself for the good of others, to be a hero. And sometimes you'll discover the problem's not with the boy. Your kids are immersed in a toxic culture. American popular culture right now is a toxic culture. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we've got a fascinating episode in store for you guys. I think you're going to really enjoy it. And it's with Dr. Leonard Sachs. Dr. Leonard Sachs is a family physician, a psychiatrist, and he is an author who's written extensively on issues addressing boys, girls, families, and parenting. So he wrote the book, Boys Adrift, talking about the five factors that are causing boys to really struggle today. He wrote the book, Girls on the Edge, uh, The Collapse of Parenting and Why Gender Matters. There's a ton to get into with Dr. Sachs. We're planning to have him in studio in a few months. Today, we're gonna mostly focus on his book, Boys Adrift. So he does a very deep dive analysis into the status of boys today, how they're struggling compared to say 30, 40, 50 years ago. And then he has some very practical applications and tips, especially for parents, for how you can help raise your boys and do it in a way that helps them have a healthy sense of self, a healthy masculinity, a healthy future, healthy relationships. So I think you're gonna really like this, especially if you're a parent. Parent, check out Dr. Sachs's work on his website, which is www.leonardsachs.com. And with no further ado, Dr. Sachs, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. I'm a big fan of your work, and you've written extensively on a lot of issues that are near and dear to parents, to those that care about the development of both boys and girls. Uh, you've written books on gender. The one that I want to focus today on that we talk about a lot on the podcast is the growing crisis of masculinity today and what young boys especially are facing. And so your book, which I think was very prophetic, Dr. Sachs, you wrote it in 2009, Boys Adrift, the five, fa- the five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. Well, in many ways, the chickens have come home to roost here in 2023. And what men are facing today is is very challenging. You know, we talk about it again on the podcast, the red pill community has grown because of that. A lot of disaffected young men, a lot of frustration, um, economic difficulties, relationship difficulties. So I uh, just wanted to start with what got you into writing this book, first of all, and then to help us understand what these five factors are. Well, sure. I also want to mention before I forget that there is a newer edition of the book. The first edition Excellent. is now uh, pretty out of date. But a- as you uh, kindly suggested, the first edition was kind of a prophecy, and the second edition showed how the prophecy has been fulfilled. And of course, the uh, motivation to write the book came out of my family medical practice. Uh, you know, I attended public schools in Ohio, K through 12. And I vividly remember the high school honor ceremony in 1976 when I was a junior. Uh, all the students receiving honors were up on stage, and it was all boys. Uh, mm-hmm. The editor of the school newspaper, Andy Borowitz, was a boy. He's gone on to have his, an amazing career. He writes the Borowitz Report for the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the editor of the Poetry Journal was a boy. The editor of the yearbook was a boy. The president of the Student Council of Government was a boy. There, I don't recall any girls being up on stage. It was all boys. And scholars in that era, we're talking 50 years ago, uh, like Myra and David Sadker, were researching how terrible schools were for girls. Uh, and they wrote their, their last book called Failing at Fairness, published in 1994, based on their research on Uh, American schools in the 70s and 80s where the boys were the valedictorians, the boys were running everything, the boys were winning all the academic honors, and the girls were sitting quietly and being ignored. That's within living memory, but it is profoundly different from what we see today. I have visited now over 500 schools over my last 22 years. I started visiting schools because, so you asked where I how I came to be interested in this. So I started my practice in Montgomery County, Maryland as a family doctor in 1990. And I began seeing families where the girl was the star academically and captain of the girls' basketball team and straight-A student and tons of friends. And her brother was a goofball uh, playing video games. And 
it began to be clear that in our Montgomery County, Maryland community, this was widespread. And, and my first thought in the mid 90s was, geez, what's wrong with Maryland? That's so different from Northeastern Ohio, where I grew up. Uh, so I began to reach out to colleagues uh, across the United States and, and began researching this topic and discovered well, the first place I reached out to was my hometown and found that, yeah, it's not the way it used to be. Uh, the the boys have retreated. And this growing gender gap in, in achievement is not due primarily to girls doing better. It's due primarily to boys doing worse. And one, that's one of the big points I make in my book, Boys Adrift. If, if the gender gap was growing because primarily because girls are doing better, I don't think it'd be a problem. I think it'd be cause for celebration, but that's not why it's growing. Let me just give very quickly one illustration of how we know that. Uh, way back in 1980, the National Endowment for the Arts surveyed a large and demographically representative sample of teenagers across the United States and asked them, what do you like to do in your spare time? And they were especially interested in getting at who's reading for fun. Well, back in 1980, girls were a little bit more likely than boys were to read for fun, but only a little bit more likely. Well, recently they did it again, went back and asked the same questions to a new cohort of teens across the United States. But they found that the gender gap in reading has widened dramatically. Mark Barline, the lead investigator on that study, and his colleague Sandra Stotsky said, uh, the gender gap had become a chasm, is the word they used. And quoting from their, their paper, they said, reading has become a marker of gender identity. Girls read, boys don't. The gender gap widened not because girls are reading more. They're not. Girls today are reading somewhat less than girls were reading 40 years ago. But American boys have stopped reading for fun. It is now very unusual to find a white, black, or Latino boy who's reading a book not assigned for school on his own time for fun. That that was common 30 years ago. It's rare. It's very rare today. And that, of course, jives with my experience as a family doctor talking with uh, children and teens in my office. Uh, so why? Why did this happen? Uh, that's the motivation for my book, uh, Boys Adrift, the five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. You guys, Advent is coming up soon. It is the most beautiful time of year leading up to Christmas. There is so much to celebrate and what better way to prepare for Christmas than improving your prayer life. We just did an episode about this on the podcast and it's why I'm so happy that Hallow is sponsoring the show. Hallow is the number one Christian prayer app in the world. You will get three months free so you can start now with the Hallow app and it will take you through Christmas. And this is beautiful prayers that you can pray throughout the day. There's daily scripture readings and Bible readings. There's sleep stories. I'm on the app reading, I think, the Book of Wisdom and praying pro-life prayers so you have that as well. But there's some amazing stuff on there. Jonathan Rumi, from The Chosen, other actors lending their voices so you can pray with them, and just incredible treasure trove of spiritual meditations, scripture readings, prayers that you can pray. What better way to prepare for the Christmas season? Download the Hallow app today. You can get three months free by using my link at the link in the bio. Let's enter the Christmas season in a spirit of prayer and deepening our walk with God. So, I mean, I think everyone listening is thinking, okay, the last 30 years, what happened in the last 30 years dramatically to boys and girls that would result in them reading less? And I think the universal answer would be screen time. So I know that you address that extensively in your book and you have other factors in addition. So can you run us mm -hmm. through the factors that, as you see it, boys are making boys adrift? And then I really want to spend time on solutions because I know everyone listening is keenly interested in that. A lot of folks point out, yes, it's not looking good today for boys and men. Society in general is struggling. Uh, but let's start with that baseline of what are those five factors? And I know screens sure. are, are one of them. Uh, so... In no particular order, and not necessarily in order of importance, uh, the first factor is changes in education. School has become unfriendly to boys. And when I speak to parents, I often illustrate this. Um, I visited a, a high school in the United States where the uh, teacher had assigned free writing assignments. You could write about anything you wanted to. And a boy chose to write a story, uh, Battle of Stalingrad, uh, winter uh, 1942, and it's very violent. And the boy was suspended from school. And the parents were told he would not be allowed to return to school 
until the parents had obtained a, an evaluation by a licensed professional. Uh, I wrote a similar story back when I was at Shaker Heights High School in 1977, and I got an award uh, from the wow. National Council of Teachers of English for uh, they gave me their their highest honor for creative writing in, in a national competition uh, for writing a story where people get blown up. Um, uh, that's part of what I mean when I say that school has become unfriendly to boys. Uh, there's a lot more to say about that. Uh, second factor is video really, games. Really quick, uh, Dr. Yeah. Sachs, before you go to the second factor, that sounds like a teacher-driven problem. Is that a teacher-driven problem in your view? Teachers that are, they don't comprehend, you know, young boys, they want to put them in a, in sort of more, treat them like girls, or is that a curriculum problem? What do you think is underlying that? Okay, so uh, my book was not, even the first edition of my book was not the first book to call attention uh, to this growing gender gap. The first book to call attention to this was by Christina Hoff Summers called The War Against Boys uh, more than 20 years ago. And she asserts that the decline of boys is a left-wing liberal conspiracy led by Hillary Clinton. Now, I, I really like Christina Hoff Summers. I've shared a podium with her. She's a lot of fun to talk with and to listen to, but uh, Hillary Clinton is not that well organized. <laughs> The, the decline of boys is not the result of a left-wing liberal conspiracy. It's, it's, uh, and the, the uh, schools becoming unfriendly to boys is not the result of a left-wing liberal conspiracy. It's the result of good people with reasonable intentions making uh, rational decisions, which had the unintended result of disengaging boys. Let me just very quickly illustrate one example. So as I mentioned, I grew up in northern Ohio. We get a lot of snow right off Lake Erie, Lake Effect Snow. Uh, during the winter months when I was at Lomond Elementary School in Shager Heights, Ohio, uh, as a child, we would uh, put on our jackets and go out on the playground during recess and lunch, and we'd throw snowballs at each other. And the teachers would come out and join us, uh, students against teachers. I remember Mr. Albers was a great shot, get you right between the eyes every time. Today, two boys start throwing snowballs at each other on school property. During school hours, a teacher's going to run out and say, what are you guys doing? You can't be doing that. You got to wait till after school and go somewhere else. No throwing of snowballs allowed on school property. And the unintended message that boys are getting is that your kind is not welcome here. Mm -hmm. Boys doing things that boys have always done, pointing fingers at each other, saying, bang, bang, you're dead, drawing pictures of weapons, uh, writing stories in which people get killed, and throwing snowballs at each other. Boys doing things that boys have always done now gets you in trouble. That's part of what I mean when I say that schools have become unfriendly to boys. And there's a better way, which I first learned 20 years ago when I visited St. Andrews, a boys' school north of Toronto, Ontario, where they have a very simple rule. If you want to throw snowballs, go to the football field. The throwing of snowballs is prohibited everywhere on campus, except on the football field where it is allowed. And at the entrance to the football field, there's a basket of goggles. You want to throw snowballs? You put on a pair of goggles, and you can go and throw snowballs at one another to your heart's delight. Inbounds on the football field, out of bounds everywhere else. And that's a principle we found very useful, and we've deployed <laughs> that at many American schools over the last 20 years with good effect. And some American schools have found it necessary to... Uh, create a waiver, uh, indemnity, uh, holding the school harmless in the event that a kid is injured by a thrown snowball. That's fine. You have to do whatever you have to do <laughs> to protect the school from liability. But don't prohibit the throwing of snowballs on school property. Why not a snowball throwing tournament? When you get a blizzard, uh, you got a lot of snow on the ground, have your PE instructor set up a snowball throwing tournament a week from Monday. After school, we're going to uh, – totally voluntary. We're going to put you in pairs. And in each pair, you get three chances to hit the target. Whoever hits it more advances, whoever doesn't sits down. And at the end of the day, we have uh, one grand champion. When you sponsor such a tournament, a snowball throwing tournament, we found about 70% of the kids who turn up are boys, but about 30% are girls. Uh, some girls love to throw snowballs. Many boys don't. Gender is complicated, but gender matters. It's easy to make the school friendly to boys without making it unfriendly to girls. Mm -hmm. And again, when I lead workshops for teachers, I share strategies I've learned now from visiting more than 500 schools, some of which are doing this very well. Wow. All right. So next factor, factor number two, and we'll come factor back to the, the masculinity is, question is, with schools in a moment too. Is video games. Uh, 
And video games have really changed. And I still find old people, by which I mean people over 35, when they think of video games, they're thinking of Pong or Pac-Man. And they, they really haven't seen a game like RDR2 uh, or Grand GTA V. They don't understand how real and vivid these worlds are. And I tell parents, imagine the best action movie, the best James Bond movie you ever saw except you're not watching one actor pretend to kill another actor. You are James Bond. And if you have a 200-watt subwoofer with 5.1 surround sound, when the mortar round lands near you, books books will fall off your bookshelf in the room. Uh, It's that immersive. James Bond is immortal. He can never die. So that kind of undermines some of the tension because you know he will never die. But you will die. You'll probably die 20 times uh, before you accomplish your mission in some of these video games. Uh, It's incredibly real. RDR2, one of the greatest video games of all time and and extremely popular with American boys right now. Uh, That stands for Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, took over seven hundred, uh, uh, took in over seven hundred million dollars in its opening weekend. By comparison, Avatar two thousand nine, uh, still the number one movie all time grossing, took in about less than eighty million in its opening weekend. Uh, these movie, these video games are way bigger than Hollywood uh, in terms of their earnings. Uh, they spend in, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to make these video games be immensely realistic and a boy you, it takes 40 hours to complete all the to to complete rdr2 uh, and when you've done it boys will tell you they really feel like they've accomplished something and they haven't uh, the video game ultimately is a lie it's it's undermining their motivation to achieve in the real world but hey this has become a big part of the culture of american teenage boys. If you are the first in your group to finish all the missions in RDR2 to complete the game, you absolutely want your friends to know that will greatly raise your status in the eyes of the other boys. If you get an A instead of a B on the Spanish final, you probably don't even want the other boys to know. That could lower your status in the eyes of your peers because academic academic achievement, working hard to get a good mark, is now seen as unmasculine by many boys. So, yeah, the screens are a major factor. It's not the whole story, but it is one of five factors. A third factor are medications for attention deficit disorder. According to the latest data from the CDC, one in five uh, teenage boys in the United States now is now on medication for ADD. And I can tell you in some communities, it's a lot higher than that. Uh, And it turns out the medications, which are most popular, Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, Metadate, Folkland, Detrana. These medications damage the motivational center of the brain, the nucleus of wow. uh, And, um, you know, I was doing the Boys Adrift talk. The Boys Adrift talk is a talk for parents where we go through each of the five factors and what parents can do to engage and motivate their son. And during question and answer, a father said, father said, you know, Dr. Sachs, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't take you seriously. You're claiming that Adderall and Vyvanse damage the brain He said, if that were remotely true, and I interrupted him, I said, if that that were remotely true, you would have heard about that before, right? From someone with better credentials than me, a family doctor, someone like Dr. Joseph Peterman, chief of pediatric psychiatry research at Harvard Medical School. And uh, I then proceeded to show how uh, Dr. Peterman admitted to taking millions of dollars for the drug companies that he's never publicly disclosed in hearings conducted by uh, Senator uh, Chuck Grassley. Um, And uh, when Senator Grassley called in many leaders of child psychiatry, and they all acknowledged uh, uh, taking this money. One one of them, Charles Nemiroff, uh, uh, it might not have been Charles Nemiroff, but one one of his guests, a leading psychiatrist, was asked why he didn't disclose this. And he said, basically, well, everybody does it. He didn't feel any need to disclose it because all he said all the leaders of child psychiatry do this. We take millions of dollars from the drug companies. We don't publicly disclose it. And that was very troubling because here you have the, the leaders of American child psychiatry telling us it is standard for them to take millions of dollars for the drug companies to function as paid spokespersons for the drug companies and not to tell us. So that's a real problem. 
Well, we've heard but, that before with other uh, with other drugs. I mean, I we've yeah. covered birth control on the podcast before, and the lies about that coming from even the medical establishment. So you, well, and, it's not a surprising tale what you're describing it, in, uh, with in ADHD the book, medication. In Boys Adrift, I provide 15 different scholarly references uh, from Harvard Medical School. Ironically, uh, among others, researchers at Harvard and other uh, medical schools have found that these medications damage the, the motivational center of the brain, which is not surprising if you're know any neuroscience, these medications, Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, Metadate, work by mimicking the action of dopamine. And we find the highest concentration of dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens. So it's not at all surprising that the area of the brain where we find all the dopamine receptors would be the area of the brain most affected by these medications. Uh, so uh, that's a real problem because in this country, uh, and in Canada and in no other countries, it is common for doctors to say, well, let's try Vivance and see if it works. Um, you know, I was, I actually spoke at Harvard Medical School and I, 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 I'm sorry, it was not Harvard Medical School. It was Harvard University mm -hmm. where I spoke at a conference titled Learning and the Brain. And I would love to tell you that my presentation was the buzz of the conference, but it wasn't. The presentation everyone was really excited about was a presentation by Dr. Joseph Gabrielli from MIT, who somehow got permission to give Adderall to normal kids and withhold medication from kids with severe ADD, and then study the ability of kids in both groups to learn on and off medication. And he found that this stimulant medication helps normal kids more than it helps kids with ADD. Wow. That's a tremendously important finding because many times as a family doctor and PhD psychologist, I've been in the situation of saying to parents, look, your son doesn't meet criteria for ADD. He doesn't actually even come close. And the parents will say, yeah, but the other doctor gave him Vyvanse and it made such a difference. In other words, the parents are interpreting the response to medication as though the response to medication had some diagnostic significance. This medication was prescribed for ADD. It was helpful. Therefore, he must have ADD, right? Bzz, no. These medications help normal kids as much or more than they help kids with ADD. Uh, so the response to medication has no diagnostic significance. Um, so what should you do if the school says your kid has ADD? What should you do if your kid really ha does have ADD? An American kid is now 14 times more likely to be on medication for ADD compared to a kid in the United Kingdom. I, I present all those data, incidentally, in my book, The Collapse of Parenting. American kids are now m many times more likely to be medicated than kids out nights outside North America, which wasn't true 30, 40 years ago. It is true today. I wrote a book with a French publisher uh, with great help from colleagues in France called Pourquoi les garçons perdent de pied les filles se mettent en danger. And uh, writing that book with French colleagues, I learned that in all of France, there are fewer than 6,000 kids on medication for ADD. Hmm. There are more kids on medication uh, for ADD in Philadelphia um, than there are in all of France, a nation of 67 million people. In this country, medication is the first resort. Outside of North America, medication is the last resort. And incidentally, when you speak on this topic in Europe, as I have done in Munich, in Luzern, and other venues, they're actually well aware of this, of the dangers of these medications. It's in North America that doctors and parents are unfamiliar with the dangers of these medications. Wow. Uh, so uh, these medications damage the motivational center of the brain. That's a big problem. Fourth factor is endocrine disruptors. One, one quick question, Dr. Yes. Sachs. I know I keep interrupting you, but there, there's such, so much food for thought on each of these factors. On that factor of these medications, you know, America's, we also have the the uh, reputation of we love our drugs, right? We're one of the most drugged up societies in the world. And you mentioned for ADHD, kids that don't have ADHD, it can have the effect, these medications, of improving their study skills, mm -hmm. and, but they're all, it, but at the same time, you're saying it's demotivating them. So it's helping them complete like a robot homework exercises, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're learning. Is that your critique? No, that's not accurate. Uh, they're learning. Um, uh, and um, again, these medications boost uh, uh, kids' ability to learn in the short term. Um, uh, and, uh, again, many parents will be like, wow, you know, uh, so, um, a, another family where I was, uh, consulted, uh, parents were absolutely convinced, uh, that of course their son had ADD because a doctor prescribed Vyvanse 
And mom got a phone call from the school Monday afternoon. He took his first dose Monday morning. And Monday afternoon, teacher called and said, wow, I had no idea. Justin is so bright, so clever. What a difference. And he said he's on a new medication. It's really helping. And then I do my evaluation. I said, your son doesn't have ADD. And mom's like, well, that's ridiculous. This medication has been enormously helpful. The teacher, all the teachers agree he's doing so much better. Yeah, well, why is he doing so much better? So I spoke to this boy and I said, do you have a video game console in your bedroom? Yeah, of course. Uh, were you up playing last night? Yeah, sure. What were you playing? Uh, Call of Duty. Uh, when did you finish? Like one thirty. And when do you wake up? Six. He's trying to function on less than five hours sleep a night. He And he's doing this night after night after night. He is profoundly sleep deprived. Sleep deprivation perfectly mimics ADHD of the inattentive variety. There is no Connor scale. There is no Vanderbilt interview, which can distinguish the kid who's not paying because he's sleep deprived from the kid who's not uh, paying attention because he is uh, true, truly has ADHD. And you'll have a stack of Connors reports from the school. Every teacher says this kid is off the chart, inattentive. And he's, he is because he's falling asleep. He's, he's barely exhausted. staying awake in class. Uh, what's Adderall? What's Vyvanse? They're amphetamines. Hmm. They, they're uppers. They're speed. They <laughs> it's compensate. Like, uh, caffeine jolt in the morning. It's, to get it's him going. much, much, much stronger than caffeine. Um, and uh, yeah, it compensates for the sleep deprivation. I'm not disputing the fact that this was, medication was enormously helpful. I'm sure it was. But the appropriate remedy for sleep deprivation is sleep, not Schedule II amphetamines. And the parents finally agreed to remove the video game console from the bedroom <laughs> to ensure that there were no screens, no video games in the bedroom. He's getting a good night's sleep. He's off medication and he's doing much better. Uh, but again, many parents don't even have a clue that their son is up at two in the morning playing video games. Wow. And that gets into topic I discuss in my book, The Collapse of Parenting. It's, it's a primary responsibility of parents to ensure that their 14-year-old is getting a good night's sleep. It is not reasonable to put that burden on the 14-year-old boy. What's the boy supposed to say when his friends say, hey, where were you last night at midnight when we did, when we did the, um, the collaborative ambush on World of Warcraft. Why weren't you part of that? Is the boy supposed to say, well, researchers have found that sleep deprivation in <laughs> adolescence is a major risk factor in the etiology of both anxiety and depression. You know, you can't do that. You have to say, hey, my evil parents took my video game console out of my bedroom. They lock it down between 9 a.m. Uh, after 9 p.m. Uh, you have to allow your son to say that. You have to have the courage to be the evil parent, recognizing that American popular culture now makes it cool to be up at midnight playing video games with your friends online. So the parents have to step in and find the courage to turn off the device. And that's actually more a focus of my book, The Collapse of Parenting. What happens when parents don't do their job? So I love sharing secrets about beauty and fashion that I found to be really helpful. And I love learning them from other people. And the one that I wanted to share with you today is about Nimi Skincare. Nimi Skincare is a sponsor of this podcast. But before they became a sponsor, I got their product and I tried it because I'm very picky and I wanted to actually believe in the product. And I discovered that this was not only a product that I wanted to sponsor my show, but that this was a product that I would be using every single day because it's that good. I use the moisturizer every single night before I go to bed and it makes my skin feel so replenished and refreshed in the morning and it is moisturized and it helps with wrinkles and lines. They have a fantastic sunscreen that I've also been using. They have a great vitamin C cleanser that I really like using at night after I take off makeup. I can't recommend Nimi Skincare enough. What is also so awesome about this company is that they share your values. This is a pro-life, pro-family company that is proud of where they stand. They're really careful about their ingredients. They're really beautiful about their branding. And the product itself is top of the line. Check out NimiSkincare.com today. I really think you will love this product. I think you'll become a believer as I have become. This is also a great gift you can give yourself for Christmas or a great gift you can give your loved one for Christmas. And... If you use the code Lila at checkout, you can get 15% off your order. That's the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order at NimiSkincare.com. And that's Nimi, N-I-M-I, Skincare.com, Nimi, N-I-M-I, Skincare.com. All right, very so, good. Fact, factors four so and five. Factor four. So 
Factor four is endocrine disruptors. Male hormone levels have dropped by half over the last, more than half over the last 50 years. Sperm counts have fallen by more than half over the last 50 years. And that's happened because of endocrine disruptors. Uh, so you have a plastic, you have a, you have a, bo a bottled water in a clear plastic container. That clear plastic is a substance called polyethylene terephthalate. And I showed in a paper published uh, by the National Institutes of Health, uh, uh, of review article that I wrote, pulling together many studies showing that uh, that plastic is going to leach diethylate and antimony into the water. Uh, it doesn't have a taste, you don't realize it, but you are consuming substances that act in your body like female hormone when you drink bottled water. Uh, what happens when children or teenagers consume substances that act like female hormones? Well, the answer is different depending whether we're talking about girls or boys. With girls, you get an earlier onset of puberty. Uh, more than half of American girls now begin puberty prior to their 10th birthday, uh, the process of puberty prior to their 10th birthday. Uh, and that directly leads to anxiety and depression among girls with early onset of puberty. And that's a major focus of my book, Girls on the Edge. But it doesn't accelerate the onset of puberty in boys. On the contrary, it lowers testosterone levels. And it turns out that teenage boys and young men rely on testosterone for drive. And I cite 10 different studies in Boys Adrift showing that when you look at motivated, hardworking young men and compare them to less motivated, lazy young men, the motivated, hardworking young men have higher testosterone levels. Men rely on testosterone for drive. Women do not. When the same researchers look at women who are hardworking, motivated, and compare and draw blood on them and compare what they find to women who are less motivated, there's no difference in hormone levels. Women do not rely on hormones for drive and motivation, but men do. They rely on testosterone and 5 alpha dihydrotestosterone. And those levels have dropped dramatically as a result of endocrine disruptors. And the result, that is a, that is a factor. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a very easy factor to, to fix. Don't drink water out of a plastic bottle. Pour water into a steel canteen, as I do, and drink it from, the, from, from your tap into a steel canteen. It happens to be a lot cheaper. Uh, and it's a lot safer. Um, uh, again, I'm old enough to remember when condiments like ketchup and mayonnaise were sold in glass bottles. Today, they're sold in plastic bottles. Same with pasta sauce. When you, uh, when the manufacturer squirts pasta sauce into a, uh, a container, it's squirted at about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. It's at a very high temperature because it has to be sterile. Uh, well, if you do that in a glass bottle, it's not a problem. You do that in a plastic bottle, and you're greatly going to promote leaching of these uh, endocrine disruptors like diethylhexylphthalate into the contents of the bottle. And American kids are drinking bottled water. They're consuming uh, ketchup, mustard, uh, pasta sauce, and many cosmetics uh, ha are vectors of endocrine disruptors. So again, it costs little or nothing to eliminate endocrine disruptors from your life. It's really not that much more expensive to buy ketchup in a glass bottle. You can find it. It's a few pennies more. Ketchup's not really that expensive. Uh, uh, and it's worth it. And that's what, that's what we do in our family. We buy and things in glass bottles. And when you say things, you don't just mean food, but you also mean it sounds like soap or products that you do apply directly to the skin. Or is yeah, that not and as again, important? again, that's real easy. Uh, the Environmental Working Group ewg.org/skindeep is a free resource. You just type in what you're looking for, and it'll show you what products are safe and what products are not. Again, it doesn't cost much or anything to greatly reduce your kid's exposure to. Uh, endocrine disruptors. Uh, don't microwave in plastic. I mean, you go through the frozen food aisle and they want you to microwave your food in the plastic bag, which we know is immensely toxic. Uh, and all kinds of toxins are leaching into your, into your food. Cut open the plastic, put it in a dish and microwave it. Uh, it takes, you know, 30 seconds and it's much, much, much safer. Again, it's easy to do this. I also reference a book uh, that uh, presents the same material in, in a very um, fun way. Uh, the book is called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. Mm -hmm. And these two Canadians 
set out to see if they could reverse it uh, by for a month, being very careful not to consume anything that was full of endocrine disruptors. And within a month's time, all their hormone levels came back to normal. Uh, wow. You can fix this. It costs very little to do it. Uh, Slow Death by Rubber Duck. Uh, uh, great fun. Well, Dr. Sachs, what about plastic lining in, uh, you know, to-go coffee cups as an example? Uh, yeah, not a good idea. Uh, again, make your <laughs> coffee right? <laughs> in your brewer and put it in a steel container and oh. you will be fine. It's not hard to do it right. It's not hard to do it right, but stay away from plastic. And then the fifth factor is the revenge of the forsaken gods. Uh, and I always sh I try to acknowledge my patient uh, in my own medical practice who suggested that title. A, uh, his name is Anders Ekloff, and he uh, is an amateur anthropologist. He reads a lot of anthropology. And we were talking about how so many traditional societies in, in the South Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa, the boy does not become a man automatically. He has to earn it. Uh, and the parents have to make sacrifices to the relevant gods to ensure that their son will make that transition to manhood. And, and he might not. He may fail at the task, in which case he remains a boy. He may, in some of these communities, you'll find males who are 40 years old, but they're not allowed to marry. They can't own property. They, ha they never pass the test mm. to become men. And my patient, Anders Ekloff, suggested that we live in a society which is experiencing the revenge of the forsaken gods. We no longer take that process of becoming a man seriously. And the result is we have men who want to be boys, uh, adult men who are spending their free time playing video games with their 12-year-old nephews. Um, the more scholarly way to describe that fifth factor would be the collapse in the social construction of masculinity. 50 years ago, if you were to say to a boy, be a man, he knew exactly what that meant because he was immersed in a culture uh, with, you know, movies starring men like Paul Newman and Sidney Poitier and Gary Cooper. And it was clear what it meant to be a man. It meant to be courageous, to be willing to sacrifice yourself for for the good of others, to be a hero. I was speaking at Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana, one of the few remaining all-male colleges in the United States. And with, uh, after consulting with the uh, college leadership, I met with all the freshmen at Wabash College. And, uh, and it was back and forth conversation. I said to them, what does it mean to be a gentleman? Raise your hand if you think you know what the word gentleman means, if you'd care to share your definition of what it means to be a gentleman. And the boy shot up his hand and he said, being a gentleman means you go to gentlemen's clubs and watch girls take their clothes off. I said, okay, that's, re that's really funny. Can anyone so else give sad. a more serious, can anyone else give a more serious definition? And another boy says, well, gentlemen, where's a three-piece suit? A gentleman o opens doors for women. It's all surface. It's all appearance. And I don't blame these boys. How should they know if they have received no instruction? What does it mean to be a good man? Um, again, when I do this talk for parents, I talk about TV shows of, of a generation ago, um, like the Andy Griffith show, uh, uh, and compare that to TV shows today, like uh, The Simpsons or Modern Family. Mm -hmm. uh, the presentation of the father in uh, American uh, television um, you look at all the most popular TV shows of 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, the father is consistently knowledgeable, competent, reliable, responsible, uh, not only on the Andy Griffith show or My Three Sons in the 1960s, but even on the Cosby show or Family Ties in the 1980s. But in writing my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I've reviewed the 150 most popular shows to see how many of them occasionally at least occasionally, depict a father as knowledgeable, competent, reliable, responsible. Out of 150 shows, I found one, Blue Bloods, starring wow. Tom Selleck, which at least occasionally depicts a father. One out of 150. Blue Bloods is now a unique outlier. It is not characteristic. Again, Modern Family would be much more typical. Uh, Dog with a Blog, uh, a Disney Channel show 
The father supposedly a school psychologist knows nothing about what kids want or what kids need. The talking dog is always wiser, more insightful than the idiot dad. Uh, Boys need to see a man in order to become a man. And our, our, Culture no longer offers good role models. Again, uh, 1962, Sam Cooke had a number one hit song in the United States. He sang, don't know much about history. He sang, now, I don't claim to be an A student, but I'm trying to be, because maybe by being an A student, baby, I could win your love for me. He goes on to mention French geometry and tri- trigonometry as subjects in which he's going to try harder to earn an A rather than a B, because he believes that by being an A student, he will raise his status in the eyes of the pretty girl. And that was characteristic of American culture Mm -hmm. in that era. Uh, A generation ago, American popular culture, the culture of people who spoke English at home, was the culture of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Simon and Garfunkel. Not anymore. Now it's the culture of Drake and Bruno Mars. Uh, Drake has had more top 10 songs uh, than anyone else in American history. He's had 79 top 10 hit songs uh, compared to 40-something for uh, Taylor Swift. And his songs are full of the F word, the N word, the A word. Uh, uh, He says, I'm undoubtedly the hottest. That's just me being modest. My ball's bigger than yours. And I can't quote any of the rest of that number one hit song because it's full of the F word, the N word, and the A word. Um, Incidentally, the New York Times, in reviewing that song, praised Drake for his lyrical vividness. Uh, uh, Drake, Bruno Mars, uh, Eminem. Uh, Lil Nas X. Uh, Lil Nas X had a number one hit song in the United States. He got two Grammys uh, where he said, can't nobody tell me nothing. You can't tell me nothing. And that's the culture of disrespect in a nutshell. The opening chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, is titled The Culture of Disrespect. That American popular culture has become a culture of disrespect where it's cool and funny to be disrespectful to others, to be disrespectful to adults, the culture of Lil Nas X, Drake, and Bruno Mars. Uh, it is impossible to imagine Drake or Bruno Mars singing a song about how they're going to try harder to earn an A rather than a B. It just, it's just it, inconceivable. And, and that's and today, a problem. Part of that world adjacent, like I think about the red pill world, I'm sure you've heard of it, but it's you know mm-hmm. this whole idea of simping for a woman, like how dare you try to be better for a woman women are all messed up today and they're not really worth it at large is the is the narrative which you know i can understand the the perspective because you know we're to focusing on men right now but there's a degrading process that's happened in the behavior and and also i would just say in the in the health of women today at large well what, boys yeah. want to be men mm-hmm. and girls want to be women but we no longer give them guidance mm-hmm. right. i wrote an article years ago for psychology today titled ladies and gentlemen skanks and pimps um, and I was commenting on a New York Times article where one of their columnists said how offended she was when her young son came home from school and said that the teacher had told them about being ladies and gentlemen. And the New York Times columnist was so offended. Ladies and gentlemen, that's so sexist. Uh, she said, we shouldn't be using terms like that. We should just teach all students to be good citizens because ladies and gentlemen is reinforcing the heteronormative binary oh and and only 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 republicans and idiots believe in the heteronormative binary enlightened people know better uh was the point of this new york times columnist and uh it was around that time that uh two high school boys in steubenville ohio uh were on trial for rape a, a girl had passed out at a party uh and they had sexually assaulted her and Everyone thought this was fine. Other kids were videoing it because they thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, Mike DeWine, who was the, uh, at that time, Attorney General of Ohio prosecuting the case, said he encountered unbelievable casualness as he interviewed these kids and the witnesses, no awareness that they'd done anything wrong. Boys are not born knowing what they mean, what it means to be a gentleman. A gentleman would know that you never touch a girl when she's drunk that you protect her from any uh, bad men who don't know that. When you fail to teach boys to be gentlemen, you don't end up with virtuous citizens. You end up with pimps. Mm. Uh, 
And when you fail to teach girls to be ladies, you don't end up with virtuous citizens. You end up with skanks. Hence the title of my article, Ladies and Gentlemen, Skanks and Pimps. If you ignore gender differences, again, uh, responding to that New York Times column, you don't end up with virtuous citizens. You end up with boys who think there's nothing wrong with molesting a teenage girl who's passed out on alcohol and girls who get drunk on alcohol. Uh, and don't know how to say no. Dr. So Sassu, everybody loses. These are cold mornings now, even here in California. And that's why I love to start the morning with a hot cup of Seven Weeks Coffee. SevenWeeksCoffee.com is America's pro-life coffee company. So you get organic, ethically sourced, gourmet, delicious coffee. And 10% of all the proceeds from Seven Weeks Coffee Dot com Go directly to the pro-life movement to support pregnancy resource centers that help moms and babies in need. So when you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, you subscribe or you just get one bag of delicious coffee that you can then enjoy every single morning with your loved ones. You are also supporting the pro-life movement with 10% of everything that you spend going directly to help moms and babies in need. So check out sevenweekscoffee.com today and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order at sevenweekscoffee.com. Everyone has is losing. I mean, that's the state today and why this conversation and your work is so important. You, you, you've referenced it a little bit or you've, t- you've kind of tiptoed towards it, you know, on the sexual ethics issues. But, you know, pornography um, has just proliferated in the last few decades. What impact do you think that has had on men and their masculinity and th- flourishing and then also their relationships? Well, you're absolutely right. It's huge. And it, it I devote a lot more of the second edition to Boys Adrift uh, talking about it. Because again, a lot of parents don't understand how profoundly this has changed, how normal it has become. Uh, so I was at, I was invited to speak at a boys high school to the boys on this topic. And I said, uh, again, when I, when I meet with the students, it's always question and answer, even in a large assembly. Uh, so I said, all right, um, I want you to raise your hand if you have at least a thousand porn photos or videos on your devices. And basically every hand in the room goes up. Honest. 400 kids. Wow. 400, yes, every hand. Uh, then I said, all right, raise your hand if you don't have any porn on any device. In a room of 400 kids, three hands go up. I say, okay, uh, you three uh, who have your hands raised, would any of you be willing to share with your colleagues for what reason you don't have any porn on your device? And one boy raised his hand. He said, well, I'm a born again uh, Christian. Uh, I don't, uh, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I don't think he'd want me to do that. And the other two boys sitting together said, well, we're Mormon and we're not allowed. Hmm. Uh, Okay. Well, they have an excuse. They're Mormon. They're evangelical. I don't actually believe the other 400 boys. I don't believe that all of those 400 boys have at least a thousand porn photos and videos, but that's the new normal. That's, you're going to raise your hand and say you do, even if you don't, because that's a new normal. And the school administrators had asked me to come and speak to the boys because in car line, waiting to be picked up, they're all looking at porn and showing it to their friends. And then, and, and there's no shame. There's no awareness that a gentleman doesn't look at porn. And again, I lead these conversations with students, ideally in a smaller group than 400, where I say, does a good man look at porn? And I just hear, what they, well, of course, you know, why? What's wrong? No one's getting hurt. And again, I've worked out with the school leadership in advance, of course, how we're going to structure this. And you need to get the permission of the school leadership because you don't want the boy coming home and saying, hey, mom, guess what we talked about in school today without the parents being aware and on board why this is so important. Mm-hmm. And where I'm leading this conversation toward is, no, a good man does not look at pornography because pornography degrades not only the woman depicted, but also the man who consumes. You're trying to inspire boys to want to be better men. You know, for all of human history, of which we have any recorded record, the sex drive has been a powerful motivator for men. And men have been motivated to achieve in the real world in order to impress the young woman and say, look, I can be a good provider. Let's start a family together and I'll be a good provider and we'll have kids together and it's going to be great because because I'm strong and accomplished and I can do stuff. Pornography profoundly undermines that. Let me just quickly give you one example. 
Um, so mom confronts her son one day. Again, an example from my own medical practice. Mom confronts her son. She says, what's the story? You wake up late every morning. You work a few hours a week at the coffee shop. You're 28 years old. You don't have a career. You, you, don't, you don't have a life. You don't even have a girlfriend. And he said, well, I used to have a girlfriend. Then she found out I only work a few hours a week at Starbucks. She dumped me. And mom was like, well, duh, what young woman wants to be a, with a man who's got no ambition beyond earning money for his, his, his video games? Uh, she insisted he come speak with me. So he did. And I asked him to tell me about his uh, girlfriend. And he said, yeah, she was fat. She wanted me to take her places, do stuff. Nineteen ninety five a month. I said, wait, what, what's 1995 a month? I don't follow. And he mentioned a porn site. And he said, and the girls are way prettier. I said, wait, those aren't girls. Those are pictures on a screen, pixels. Wouldn't you rather be intimate with an actual woman? He said, ha, no. That's becoming more and more common. Any 12-year-old has in his pocket unlimited pornography. Any, any smartphone can access unlimited porn. You don't need a credit card, I'm, I'm told. You don't need a credit card. You, don't need, you just say you're 18 and you're in. Uh, and it is changing the lived experience of American boys in profound ways. Uh, I'm hearing from deans of students at universities we're saying our dance, we're canceling it because the boys aren't showing up. They're not asking girls out. They'd rather stay in their dorm room and masturbate over pornography rather than take the time and trouble to ask a girl out. When you actually meet with the boys, they'll also talk about Me Too and how scared they are that their lives are going to be ruined if they touch a girl the wrong way. So the boys have all kinds of excuses. But the point is the pornography is profoundly undermining motivation. Uh, and that's why parents have to lock it down. Again, uh, going back to my book, The Collapse of Parenting, um, if you're a parent, you've got to install an app on your son's device that limits, blocks porn. Uh, and uh, so uh, another school did something very courageous, and there's a school where I visited. They asked all the parents, this is another boys' high school, all boys. Ask the parents, how often does your son look at porn? This is a high school. How often does your son look at porn? Uh, never once a month, once a week, more than once a week, every day. More than 80% of the parents said never. My son never looks at porn. They then asked the boys at the same high school, how often do you look at porn? Never once a month, once a week, more than once a week every day. More than 80% of the boys said more than once a week or every day. And it was very courageous for the parent, for the school to share that with the parents because it's a, you know, private school world is a competitive world. And the danger of telling parents that more than 80% of the boys at this school are looking at porn frequently is some parents might say, oh, the, the, all perverts at this school, I'm going to transfer my kid to the other school where they're probably more virtuous. In fact, you would find the same numbers everywhere. Uh, is my experience, having discussed this with boys at many different schools across the United States. Uh, where are the kids? They uh, Part of that survey, they asked the boys, where are you looking at porn? They're all looking at porn on their phone. What proportion of the kids' parents have installed any kind of app to in any way limit porn on the device? Uh, only 4%. Wow. And a lot of parents are skeptical. They'll be like, oh, come on. Uh, What's the point of installing the the app? I'm sure my son will just get around it. So one popular app is called Net Nanny. I've done a lot of events across Silicon Valley. I actually met with employees in Net Nanny because uh, a parent will say, "My kid will just Google how do I get around pro parental controls on Net Nanny," and, and they'll they'll be around it. And I, I spoke to employees in Net Nanny, and they told me they have colleagues whose full-time job is to Google the phrase, how do I get around parental controls on that nanny? And that the, if they find a kid has found a hole, they patch it usually wow. with on, <laughs> in hours. I do encourage parents to install parental monitoring apps 
on any device with internet access and explain to your son, explain to your daughter, look, my parents insisted on knowing where I was at all times. I have to know where you are at all times. It's part of my job as your parent. I'm going to see everything you're doing online. And, and, and daughter, if I see that you've taken a picture that's inappropriate, you're going to lose the device. Mm-hmm. And, and the app will detect the picture before anything's even done with it. Uh, and, and you have to do this uh, to... Because your kids are immersed in a toxic culture. American popular culture right now is a toxic culture where it's cool for girls to be skanks, where it's cool for boys to be disrespectful and defiant. Mm. That's a toxic culture. It's not the culture of 30 years ago or 50 years ago. It's changed in some really bad ways. And parents need to be on their guard. You know, the original title of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, which I like to mention was a New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. The original title of that book, the title of the manuscript I sent to the publisher was The Collapse of American Parenting. And the subtitle was Why Most Kids Would Now Be Better Off Raised Outside North America. Wow. Well, uh, non-celebrities don't get to choose your title, but they did leave in most of the material, including the chapter where I show that American kids are now 10, 20, 30 times more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety, depression, ADD compared to kids outside North America. So, Dr. Sachs, I I hate to interrupt you because this is all gold. I mean, Mm -hmm. everyone needs to get your books. We're going to have to have you back in the podcast because I know we just have a few minutes left here. In the time we have remaining, I think you've done a phenomenal job of laying out. It is a mess. It's a toxic wasteland, as you called it. You've shared some really powerful recommendations for what parents and adults can do to help the young people in their lives. You know, you talked about phone controls. You talked about ditch the water or the plastic uh, packaging Can you give a few more concrete recommendations, especially when it comes to school? Because I feel like that's one that's maybe out of a lot of parents' immediate hands. If their kids are in school, they're not homeschooling. How do you make it maximized or optimized for boys with the existing structures that most people are dealing with? Well, if if your boy is not engaged, not motivated, you have to determine, is this school unfriendly to boys? You know, again, as a family doctor and PhD psychologist, Often I have been asked to evaluate this boy and, and we'll look at the reports from the school and I'll uh, spend uh, one or two sessions with the boy. Uh, and sometimes you'll discover the problem's not with the boy, but with the school. And the solution is not to medicate the boy, but to change the school. Uh, and what you should may parents have, look for in a school? What well, for their what's boys? a boy-friendly school? Uh, uh, very, very quickly, look to see the numbers. Look at the honor roll. At a co-ed school, the honor roll should be roughly 50-50 boys and girls. If you find, as I did at one middle school, I visited 19 girls and three boys, and those three boys are the uh, sons of recent immigrants from East Asia, Uh, you have no white, black, or Latino boys on the honor roll at all at a school that's primarily white, black, and Latino with a few Asian immigrants. Um, That's a problem. That's not a boy-friendly school. And you may need to move. You know, my wife and I moved from Maryland to Pennsylvania. I sold my practice in Maryland and moved to Pennsylvania because we were unhappy with the choice of schools available. Your kids have to be your top priority. And if you have to move, you have to move. But some other quick tips, you have to prioritize the family. Mm -hmm. The parent-child relationship is more important than the kids' relationships with same-age peers. Cancel the play date, make a family date instead. No earbuds, no headsets in the car. When you're in the car, you should be listening to your kid, and he should be listening to you, not to Bruno Mars or Lil Nas X. Uh, Prioritize the family, fight for supper uh, together. Again, there's there's lots more in my books, Boys Adrift, uh, and the Collapse of Parenting, specifically on those topics. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. Well, we definitely need to have you back on because there's so much more to discuss here, but I think this has been excellent and I so appreciate the work you're doing. It's very countercultural. You know, a lot of people, I think, uh, consider some of the things that you're saying very unorthodox uh, or heterodox views, but they're so necessary for people to know. So thank you so much. Thanks again for inviting me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. I think I said the word wow many times because what he was saying was all true. Uh, it's you know not really something that's contested or can be contested, but it also has serious implications for, okay, what do we do next? And so we got into some of that. I think there's a lot more to get into in his books. He ad- addresses that and has a lot of practical solutions. So be sure to check them out. They're great books, especially Boys Adrift, which is what we deep dive today. 
we will be hopefully having Dr. Sachs back on the podcast in the future to discuss these topics more, especially I'm interested in the collapse of parenting and his concrete advice for parents. I mean, I'm a parent of young kids, as you guys know. I've got a two-year-old and almost four-year-old, one on the way. Many of you listening are parents or you care about kids. You have nieces or nephews. So this is the big question. What do we do with the next generation? How do we raise them to be strong men and women that will be the future leaders of our society to make it healthy again? And this project is possible. It is the most urgent and important one, I believe. And it's one of the reasons that inspired this podcast, quite frankly, is exploring these topics. So thanks so much for listening. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Lila Rose podcast and leave us a review. It really does help us on Apple Podcasts or where you listen on your podcast app. Give us five stars. Leave us a review. It does help the podcast reach more people. I think we have 1,600 reviews. I'd love to get to 2,000 soon. So please give us a review. Leave us five stars. Helps the podcast reach more people. And if you're listening on YouTube, watching on YouTube, Thanks for being here. I really appreciate you guys. I love getting the comments. I love engaging with all of you. Please continue to leave that comment. Uh, ring the bell, the notification bell, so you actually hear about this podcast and the shows on YouTube. I have actually gotten comments from some of you guys that we put out new episodes. You don't see them. They don't show up in your feed. I don't know why YouTube is maybe not prioritizing the content or allowing it to show up in your feed if you're already subscribed, but don't forget to ring the notification bell if you haven't already rugged. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.